the journey began from an understanding of the gospel of Jesus. Uh, Dead Man Walking is an account of my spiritual journey. And it was first to awaken to the poor they, who lived right at our back door of our mother house in New Orleans in 10 major housing projects throughout the city and I'd never been to any of them. And the awakening came through a talk by another sister, Maria Augusta Neal, who spoke to us about Jesus and that integral to the good news that Jesus preached to the poor was that they'd be poor no longer. And for the first time, I really got it, that working for social justice wasn't a luxury or something you did on the side after you did all the other spiritual things. And so I lived among the people in the St. Thomas housing projects. Those are the people that people around the world saw and left in the Superdome when we had the hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. And everything unfurled from working with poor people. I saw the other America. And from there I got the invitation to write a man on death row. His name was Patrick Sonier. I had never written a letter where the address was death row. And I wrote a letter to this man and he wrote back. And then I visited with him and two and a half years later, I walked with him to the electric chair and watched and told him to look at my face when Louisiana electrocuted him to death. He had said, sister, you can't be there at the end. And I said, no, Patrick, no, you're not gonna die alone. Look at my face. I'll be the face of love for you. I'll be the face of Christ for you. And he looked at my face and I walked out of that execution chamber that night. It was April the 5th, 1984. And it was the middle of the night and the executions are secret rituals. People are never going to see them. And I threw up. I vomited. I'd never watched a human being killed in front of my eyes before. And that's when the mission came. You know, the, the words, whom will we send in Isaiah and send me, that I had been a witness and so I had to tell the story. And so I began. But if you think of two arms of the cross, I was on both arms of the cross because I soon moved over to the murder victims' families. Pat and his brother had killed two teenage kids and the families were in mourning. Their lives were shattered. Their 17-year-old son and their 18-year-old daughter had been killed. And I found my way to the family of the LeBlancs, who are really the hero of Dead Man Walking the LeBlancs whose son David had been killed. And from Lloyd de Blanc kneeling by his side in this little chapel in St. Martinville, I learned in him the meaning of forgiveness. He said, people in our culture think forgiveness is weak. But he said, forgiveness really means I'm a kind and loving man. I'm not going to let that hatred and bitterness take over me. They kill my son, but they're not going to kill me. And I'm going to do what Jesus said. And when I told the story in Dead Man Walking, I told stories on both sides because there are two arms on the cross. And when we get into these deep life issues, we live in a culture that tries to polarize and say, either you're for the perpetrator or you're for the victim, but we have to be for both. And it's the dignity of human life in both. And so I work for both, as all of us are called to do. We do not need to give government power to torture and execute people in this country. We can be safe without that we have prisons. And so I spend most of my waking hours getting on airplanes and going around this country and awakening people to the true gospel call to live lives of mercy and forgiveness rather than vengeance. And that's what I devote my life to. The second part of my life, I continue to accompany people on death row. I have accompanied six human beings to their deaths and told them to look at my face. And the last two people that I accompanied to death, I became convinced were innocent people. And that's in this, the story of the book, The Death of Innocence, where I take you through these two stories that are gonna be hard, hard, uh, because they break your heart. The story of Dobie Williams, uh, African-American man in Louisiana who, uh, was innocent and railroaded and, and was executed in 99. The second story is a man, Joseph Odell in Virginia, and all of Italy got involved in his case, the Italian parliament and Pope John Paul. And through Joseph Odell 
in Virginia, I had a chance to dialogue with Pope John Paul about the death penalty. In all of the social issues, as we grow and evolve and develop as a community, and we people of faith need to be people who critique our culture, who stand up and say yes to this, but no to that, no to any forms of violence, no matter how much it's legalized by the Supreme Court. And so when I had a chance to dialogue with Pope John Paul, it was a time for real honesty. And what I could do was put into the lap of Pope John Paul II, a very pastoral man, experiences of 14 years. And I raised questions to the Holy Father. I said, the Holy Father, does the Catholic Church only uphold the dignity of the innocent? When I'm walking with a man to execution, and he says to me, Sister, please pray that God, pray for me that God will hold up my legs. He's shackled hand and foot. They're going to strap him in a chair or on a, a gurney and kill him. There is no dignity in this death. What about the dignity of the guilty? And Pope John Paul intervened, and he changed the Catholic catechism. There, there was dialogue. I was one part of the dialogue. I want to make that clear. I was not the only one. But I have been relentless in the dialogue because of what my eyes have seen and my hands have touched and what I, what I have observed in accompanying people to death. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, 10 words were cut, which gave as a criteria which had served for 1,700 years of when the state could execute for grave or grievous crimes. And they cut that out of the Catechism. So in other words, no matter how grave or grievous the crime, we as a society have a way to defend ourselves without multiplying the violence and killing the killers. And then when the Pope was in St. Louis in 99, for the first time then, he put the death penalty in with the other life issues, saying no to abortion, euthanasia, phys physician-assisted suicide. And no to the death penalty, he said, which is cruel and unnecessary. He could acknowledge and see that the death penalty involves cruelty or torture, something our Supreme Court refuses thus far to see. They do not see that the death penalty is the practice of torture. They have even used words in the Furman decision that it is not against the dignity of human beings to execute them, even when we know we have an alternative of a life sentence. So through these books, I tell about my journey. The best thing we ever do for each other as people of faith is just to share with each other, let me tell you what happened to me. And let me tell you how the Spirit of God is moving in my life. And that triggers in us, it sparks in us, that very same potential that is in all of us to be people of peace. And I now have extended my work and deepened my work, not only to work for human rights and the abolition of the death penalty, but also to be able to embrace the spirituality of our planet, of Earth. If human beings are under the death penalty, our planet is under the death penalty. We used to think our oceans were infinite, the air was infinite, the soil was infinite, and we have poisoned the waters and we have poisoned the air and we have exploited. We have thought of the earth as a resource, just something to be used for, for our use, our profit, for business, cut the forest, drain the ocean of the fish. And we have to take a whole other approach to earth and so I have begun to work for that, working with young people to understand that the whole seamless garment is all connected. Human beings, yes, and we have to help people not live in poverty, have to help people live what justice really demands, that everyone has what they need for a dignified life. And, but then that also extends to earth. And so, so I live and work and continue and the spirituality is what feeds me. Airports are my cloister. Airplanes are my cloister. And I continue to feed in the community, the Catholic community of faith. And that is what keeps me going. Because finally, when you do the work of justice, it's never the work of a lone individual. And I'm very much a part of my sisters, the Sisters of St. Joseph, and the Catholic community that does peace. Mm -hmm.